you have your Bible, uh, turn to Exodus chapter 34. Uh, Lisa read Exodus chapter 34. You know, I know I'm the pastor, so sometimes things are my idea. Sometimes they're not my idea. And so sometimes I hesitate to say something's good because I don't want it to sound like I'm patting myself on the back. Man, I love hearing the scripture read. Yes. Yes. Like I just, I love hearing the scripture read for five minutes, six minutes, ten minutes. I just, I, I love that hearing the scripture. Tom, thank you for starting with a big chunk of scripture. Like I just, yes. man, if, if we don't know what to say, say the scripture. Yes. Right? Like if you don't know what to pray, pray the scripture. Like there's something so yes. beautiful about training yourself to sit and listen to the word of God because it's the word of God. And, and, and not getting caught up in, well, you know, what's this have to do with me? Everything. It's God. It's God. Like, like in Exodus 34, and we're not even going to talk about this part of it, so I'll be free for you. But like, like, like in, in Exodus 34, you get to these places where it feels like God's talking about, like, nothing. But look how detailed he is. As he starts talking about sacrifices and offerings and bread and this and that other thing. Like, this is how detailed he is. And we wonder, does he see me? Does he know me? Does he hear me? Is he working? And look, he's, he's saying these things that seem small to us so we'll know. Nothing's small to him. Like, we like to talk about how nothing's too big for God. Nothing's too small for God. But he is in every detail of our lives. And what he wants is us to bring him into every detail of our lives. To wait on him, to trust him, to listen to him. But here's the thing. That will never happen without the word of God. Yes. There's something that when you understand that God wanted a certain kind of bread cooked in a certain kind of way with a certain kind of oil and a certain amount of salt, that you start to realize maybe every part of my life matters to him. And instead of me just bringing him in from time to time and doing what I want most of the time, maybe I should start to believe that all of this matters to God because I matter to God. And it, I'm going to say it again. It will not happen if we don't learn not just to read the Bible, but to listen to the scriptures read. And to sit in boring, uncomfortable things that we have spent most of our lives going, doesn't have anything to do with me. What if it has everything to do with us? Yes. What if the fact that we won't sit still long enough to hear his word is why we also can't hear his voice? Um. And why we keep saying, he's not saying anything, he's not saying anything. What if we just haven't trained ourselves to believe that what he says matters even when I don't think it matters? It's not what used to be. It's who he is. I love that we have, are getting more and more into the practice of reading the scriptures when we're together. And I want to encourage you to do it together. Do it alone. Don't just read. Listen. Something powerful happens when you listen. Read out loud. And sit and be uncomfortable. Because I'm going to tell you, we're going to start reading bigger and bigger chunks. Like for, the, for those that are getting wondered, for those that sat there tonight and went, how many minutes is this? Because I'm going to be honest, I fall into the same thing. So before I ask anybody to read, I go on the Dwell app, which is a great app that uh, Joanne connected me with. The Dwell app, because you can just listen to any portion of scripture. And I go on because it tells you how long it is. And so when I, before I called Lisa this morning and gave her the scripture, because she'd already agreed, I went on there at six and a half minutes. I'm like, all right. All right, we're going to stretch. We're going to, we're, we're going to stretch ourselves. But we need to. That's the Word of God. Yes. How can it be boring? It's the Word of God. Aren't there people you love that they tell you the same old stories and you hang on every word just because you love them? Now, there are some people that tell you the same old stories and you try to find a way to say, you told me this already. Yes. But, it, but it's the Word of God. Yes. It's the Word of God. Can we, can we, can we just... Ask him to give us the patience to learn how to listen and sit with his word. Because if you learn how to listen to it, you'll learn how to read it. And if you learn how to read it, you'll learn how to love it. And if you learn how to love it, it will change your being. Not your life. It will change your being. And that's the whole purpose. 
is that we would be transformed, washed by the water of the Word. That's all free. Yeah. <laughs> Exodus chapter 34. We will get there. It's one another one of those nights. We will get to Exodus 34. Just keep it open. Isaiah chapter 6 says that in the year that King Uzziah died, that Isaiah saw the Lord. Just think about that for a minute, because we know that verse so well. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, I saw the Lord. Just sit in that. He saw Adonai. He saw the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He saw the God that told Moses, you can't see my face and live. He saw the God that all the prophets longed to see and that the angels longed to look into his redemption. He saw God. And when he saw him, it says that God was sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and that his train, the train of his robe filled the temple. As the seraphim flew round about God, crying out to each other. So they weren't singing a song to God. They weren't making some declaration to God. They were telling each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. In Revelation chapter 4, John the Apostle saw a door standing open in heaven and he heard Jesus invite him, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. John wrote at once he was in the spirit and he saw him who sits on the throne of heaven and when he saw him, he was surrounded by four living creatures who never ceased to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. I find it interesting that the two times that God invited people into his throne room to see him in all of his glory, that they were immediately confronted by heavenly beings that constantly declared the holiness of God. That when Isaiah saw God, he didn't write about all the things we would write about. He said there were these seraphim that never stopped circling and shouting to each other about the holiness of God. That when John was invited in by the voice of Jesus, by the voice of the one he loved, so he knew who was inviting him in. When John saw the father that Jesus had been teaching him about, the thing that he remembered the most, that struck him the most, was that these creatures just kept falling down and standing up and falling down and standing up. And each time they did, they cried out about the holiness of God. It seems to me that the image that God desires for man to see and the truth that God desires for us to know is that above everything else, he is a holy God. What does that mean? Right, so he's telling us, they're shouting it to us, and yet I don't know that we know what it means at all. Holiness is one of those words that has a lot of misconceptions, has a lot of interpretations, which means that when it comes to holiness, we all tend to have a lot of opinions. But if it is who God is, and if it is how the beings that never leave his presence describe him to each other, if it is how God described himself over and again, as we'll find out when he was giving the law to Israel in the book of Leviticus, isn't it something that we need to learn? Isn't it something we need to come to terms with? Something we need to learn how to believe and how to understand? But even more, in Leviticus, God told Israel at least four different times, not just that he was holy, but they were created and called to be holy like he is holy. And just so no one is tempted to think that the new covenant in Jesus' blood somehow frees us from the calling to holiness, Peter wrote, but as he who called you is holy, also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what does it mean? What does the holiness of God look like? For the last six months or more, I've been asking God almost every day to show me what his holiness looks like. It's become something he put on my heart. And so every day as I get up in the morning, it's something I start with. As I walk my house, it's something I come start with. It's something I do when I'm out on a run. I just keep asking him, show me your holiness. Show me what it means for you to be holy. Show me what your holiness looks like. Because here's the thing. I can't be like him 
unless I know what he looks like. I can't be the image of Jesus if I don't know what the image of Jesus is. I can't be holy unless I know what his holiness is. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I come from a background where holiness was often talked about in terms of external things. For a woman to be holy, it meant that she couldn't cut her hair, wear makeup, or pants. For a man to be holy, he had to wear long sleeves, keep his hair cut off his collar, and by no means ever wear a beard. Remember in Bible college, somebody sitting right next to me and saying, I can't see how a man could ever be holy with a beard. I didn't have a beard yet, couldn't have a beard yet, would have loved to, but had a lot of patches. Had one of those football beards, 11 on each side. <laughs> but I just wondered, like, where do we get these ideas? Where do we come up with these things? And even when we can say, this says, it's always obscure, isn't it? It's always something that was talking to somebody about something specific, and somehow we run with that, but we don't run with any of these other things that are just as obscure. Holiness in my lifetime was always described by the things we didn't do. We don't drink, we don't curse, we don't go to movies, we don't watch certain things on television. So for me, holiness was old, it was ugly, and it was a bit scary. But God wasn't any of those things. So how could he be holy and beautiful and holiness be scary? Something didn't fit together. David wrote that there is something beautiful about God's holiness. Something that calls for obedience and leads to worship and awe. Something that magnifies God's goodness and his love and transforms us from death unto life. You, we, you guys, you heard me talk about it last week, but what did David see? Between the death of Uzzah in 1 Chronicles 15, where David was angry and afraid, what did he see between there and 1 Chronicles 16 that found David singing of the beauty of God's holiness? What happened in between those two chapters that changed David's view, not only of God, but of God's holiness and of what was required of David's life to be near this holy God? Somewhere between those two events, events, David saw God through the scriptures. Because it didn't just change. Because first of all, we know he saw him through the scriptures because suddenly David did things the right way. Suddenly David did things the way the scriptures said. Suddenly the ark wasn't being moved on a cart the way the Philippines moved in the Philippines. Can you, can you tell where I like to go? The way the Philistines had moved it, the way he had most recently seen it moved, he suddenly is doing it the way God said to move it. The way he'd never seen anybody move it before. Because this has all happened, remember, before David's lifetime. This is, this is all now happening, not when David was reigning, not even before Saul was reigning. Even as Samuel was just starting his reign, it was the last time it was ever moved the proper way. And so David is in this place where he had no recollection he had to go to the Scripture. And somehow, by seeing God in the scriptures, by learning the details like we just talked about, not only did it change how David moved the ark, it changed how David viewed God. It changed how David approached God, how he worshipped God. Because I believe in the scriptures, David saw God's holiness. But I will ask us again, what does that look like? What did David see that maybe you haven't seen? Maybe I haven't seen? Maybe we have seen and we just haven't focus on it the way that we should. The Hebrew word that we translate holy is kadosh. It's used in some form 611 times in 544 different verses in the Old Testament. The sheer volume tells us that this word and the picture that it's painting are important, right? Any word that gets used 611 times, especially think of this, Jen, you're an author. We're always trying to find words that mean what we just said without saying the same thing we just said. We're always trying not to repeat ourselves, and here's the Spirit of God saying, keep saying it. Keep saying it. Don't find, an anthem, don't find a synonym for it. Just keep saying holy, and somebody's going, I don't really know what it means. He said, just keep saying it. You're going to figure it out. So along the way, if you keep saying it, if you keep hearing it, I'll show it to you. But just keep using the word that best describes me, even though you don't really know how to describe me yourself. The word itself means sacred or set apart. 
As Joanne shared a couple of weeks ago, more literally, the word holy means to be altogether other. It is uncommon. It is unlike anything else. The first time the word was ever used in the scriptures was in Exodus chapter 3. So that means we made it all the way through Genesis with nothing being called holy. We made it from creation through the flood, Noah, Abraham, the, the, the beginning of Israel. We made it all the way through. And the word had not been uttered yet. But then when you get to Exodus chapter 3, when God spoke to Moses from the burning bush at Mount Horeb, God himself said, Do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So the first time anything was holy, it was dirt. And the first time anything was called holy, it was God. He is called things holy. God continued when he met Moses. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. It then says, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So the question is simple, and the answer is also simple. What made the ground holy? What made this piece of ground different than every other piece of ground? What made it sacred or set apart? The presence of a holy God. And somehow Moses knew that if the ground was holy, it could only be because God was there. So that means if the ground was holy because God was there, it means that for something to be holy, it has to come from God. Holy is who God is. In fact, Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, one line in what is called the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb says this, For you alone are holy. This means that God is holy and all holiness has to come from God. That means that if God calls something holy, it's because he made it so. Amen. The ground was holy because God made it so. Israel was holy, was a holy nation because God said they were. The tabernacle, the utensils, the sacrifices, the priests, they were all holy for one reason. God called them holy and he is a holy God. There was nothing special other than God said it, they obeyed it, that made it holy. It's not holy because I want it to be. It's not holy because I put my best effort into it. It's not holy because I've never used it for anything other than going to church. It, right? Like my, my church suit isn't a holy suit because I only wear it to church. It's only holy if God says. It's only holy if God's in it. It's only holy if it has come from God and then been, been returned to God. So the ground was holy because God made it so. He is holiness, and holiness belongs to him, and it comes from him. Nothing can be holy apart from God. All holiness is found in and comes from God. So here's what we've seen so far. The angels called God holy. God called the ground holy. And then finally, in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, God said to Israel, we'll get there in a couple of weeks, be holy because I am holy. The first time that God announced himself as holy. The first time that he used that word to talk about himself. God was the first one to use the word holy in scripture. The created beings never stopped calling God holy in heaven. And yet, here we have the question again, what does it mean? What does holiness look like? I believe the only way to define holiness is to listen to how God describes himself. If he is holy, then holiness can't be described by anything other than him. Because none of us can look deep enough into God to say, oh, that's what he is. He has to tell us, this is who I am. Again, why the scriptures are so important. We don't get to have an opinion about God. We don't get to decide what we think God is, what we want God to be, what we hope he will be like. God has given us his word to say, here's who I am. The scriptures are the revelation of God to us. They are not how we get to God. They are this God who has come to us. And if you want to know God, you have to know him through the scriptures. The spirit breathed it out for a reason. And I think that we have become largely complacent. And what we would like the, script, the spirit to do is to bypass the scriptures. Imagine this. Imagine if I took the time to write something down for Melissa. Wrote, wrote this all down for Melissa. Melissa, this is what I need, this is what I want, this is what I think, and I give it to her, and she looks at it and goes, that's a lot to read. Could you just 
tell me? Can you, could you just, can you just tell me what you want me to do or what I need to do? Could you just, I, I really don't want to do this. Isn't that how we treat the scriptures pretty often? We're asking for a word from God without being devoted to the word of God. We would rather feel him than devote ourselves to him. We come to know him through the scriptures. And whether that starts with a word a day, a, a verse a day, a chapter a day, I don't care. Just start. Just listen. Just be faithful. Just make the scriptures a part of your life. Make the scriptures a part of your daily life. Because the way to know God is through the scriptures. The way to know that he is holy is when he starts telling you that he is. And then he starts showing you what that means. The only way for us to ever come to a place where we can define holiness is to listen to how God describes himself. If God is holy, then holiness can only be defined by looking at and listening to God. In Exodus chapter 32, when Moses was on the mountain with God, probably within a couple of weeks of God speaking to all of Israel, and Israel asking Moses, never let God speak to us again or else we're going to die. You talk to him, we'll do whatever you say, just don't let us hear that voice again. Moses is gone probably for a few days to somewhere around a couple of weeks. The people, the same people that said they'd do whatever God said, gather around Aaron and say, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. We've read about this. We've talked about this. Let's sit in it for a couple of minutes tonight. Their discomfort in waiting caused them to do what they'd seen done in Egypt. Right? They were so worried that they wouldn't get to the promised land and the thing that mattered most to their hearts that they were willing to grab for anything around them. They knew they needed a God, but they did not yet know the God they needed. And so understanding that we didn't get ourselves out of Egypt, so we're not going to get ourselves into the promised land. They were unwilling to wait for the one true living God. And they said to Aaron, give us a God, because we are afraid that Moses might not come back, which means we might not get what we want. And so instead of learning to trust him, instead of waiting for him, they built an idol. They called it their God. They gave it credit for leading them out of Egypt, and they worshipped it in the same way that they had seen others worship their idol. How often do we do this? How often do we recreate someone else's story because we don't trust God with ours? How often do, does someone have what we want and so we're trying to figure out how maybe we could do what they had done so that we can get what we want? We don't trust them and I'm going to be blunt and honest because we don't know him. If we knew him, we would trust him because he's trustworthy. And so what Israel found out and what was revealed is they didn't yet know him. And God knew that as well. Why do you think he put the space in there to test their faith? To bring them to that place of tension. To, to bring them to the place where they would decide, will we trust God and wait for Moses? Or will we panic and grab for the promised land? Because here's the thing, they weren't grabbing for a golden calf, they were grabbing the promised land. The whole point was, give us a God that will take us to the promised land. Some of us are doing some grabbing and we're not really willing to admit it. Yeah. We're not, we, we may say, I'm not really grabbing for a golden calf, but we're grabbing for promises and we're grabbing for what we want out of life and how we think it should go. And we're resisting the call to trust. Because trust is hard. Even when you know God, trust is hard. But when we can't trust him, and I'm going to again say this bluntly, it's not a condemnation. It is just, I pray, a wake-up call. In the places where we don't trust him, it is a revelation we don't know. Just all it means, because if you would know him, you would trust him. And there are places in all of our lives, so this isn't about you versus any, there are places in every one of us that are not yet trusting him, because we do not yet know him in his fullness. God told Moses to go back down the mountain, told him that Israel had corrupted themselves and were worshiping an idol. God said that they were stiff-necked and that he was going to pour out his wrath on them. He would consume them and then he would just go and start over with Moses. 
I feel like so often we read this and we just see God's anger, which is there. Like, you need to see God's anger. But I believe the real point we're being shown in that passage is what Israel deserved. Because the real point is what we all deserve. We are sinners. We have gone our own way. We have worshipped our own idols. We have disobeyed God and we have rebelled against Him. God told Adam in the very beginning that if they sinned, if they disobeyed, if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would die. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 he makes it clear. The wages of sin is death. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 we are already condemned. Our actions are deserving of God's wrath. Israel deserved to be consumed but so do we. It's important that we recognize that God's anger was justified. When he spoke to Moses, he was speaking the truth of what Israel deserved. We have to stop calling sin a mistake. We have to stop acting like it's a small thing. Jesus died for it. And I don't want to pretend that Jesus died for my mistakes. You know what a mistake is? A mistake is when they forget to put your fries in the bag when you order through the drive-thru. That's a mistake. Jesus didn't die for that. Sin is what Jesus died for. Let's stop acting like we just did one little thing or this little thing. We are sinners and God is gracious. Because when we shrink sin, we also shrink grace. If my sin isn't that bad, then his gift wasn't that good. We've got to stop acting like and calling sin a mistake. God never ever, study the scriptures, God never calls sin a mistake. He doesn't, when Moses struck the rock, instead of speaking to it, God didn't say, Moses, you made a mistake. God said, you didn't trust me. And you didn't glorify me. We want it to be smaller than it is. But for God to be seen in all of his glory, our sin has to be seen in all of its messiness. God calls your sin and my sin, all of it, he calls it rebellion, rejection, adultery, disobedience. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is deserving of death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. We have to stop because we paint God as angry when we don't understand that his wrath is justified. Moses interceded. He implored God. He said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. Notice that Moses did not appeal to God based on Israel's lack of guilt, but on God's character of mercy. Moses did not dismiss the charge or diminish just how terrible the sin was. He focused on who God was and what God had promised. I loved the way that Joanne put this during the reading plan. For those that are part of the Facebook group, she wrote in this passage that it's almost as if Moses prayed, Oh Lord, be who you are. Moses was not trying to change God's mind. He was appealing to God's character. He was asking God to be faithful, even though Israel had been adulterous. He was reminding God, not of his promises, but of his character. Not because God had forgotten, but because intercessors stand in the place between what we deserve and what, God, what God's character has proven to be. We don't change God's mind. He could not be sovereign if his mind could be changed. But he invites us to remember what he has said and to stand in that place with him. Declaring his goodness in really terrible situations. Psalm 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding, which means overflowing or literally having too much in steadfast love. We have seen the contrast of man's sin and God's character of grace from the very beginning of the story, right? 
Adam and Eve sinned and God went to them. He promised a redeemer. And in the first revelation of God's heart, God killed two animals, shed their blood, and used their death. But God gave them a covering. stories have lost their wonder because we've heard them so many times that we stop sitting with them. This again is the reason to read slow and read out loud and read fast and read a large amount and read a small amount because there are things that should jump out every time we open it. But just think of this. The God who had just been, the God who had just been cheated on, the God who had just been turned from, the God who had just been distrusted and rejected, what does he do when he sees his creation naked and afraid, covered with leaves, doing the best they could do. What does he do? He kills two animals, covers them. Because he's good. Yes. Amen. Because he's patient, because he's kind, because he's holy. Hallelujah. We want holiness to mean he struck them down. What if holiness means he held them up? Yeah. 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 What if holiness means he, he, he stayed himself? even when they weren't who and what they were created to be. The story gets even crazier if you, want, if you ask me. Then when God sent them out of Eden, it was an act of mercy to keep them from eating from the tree of life in their sinful state. Because had they eaten from that tree as they were, they would have been forever unredeemed. There would have been no hope of redemption because sin had not been paid for. And then what does God do? He sends an angel and a flaming sword to cover the garden to protect Adam and Eve, the original grabbers, from going back and grabbing the things that they missed out on and would always remember. Because it would keep them in their sin. Not because it would arouse God's anger. He kept them from staying in their sin. And then it just gets crazy. After Cain murders his brother Abel, God goes to Cain after the fact. Goes to him before and warns him. Cain does whatever he's going to do. Kills his brother. God comes back again. Where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? You read it. Go read it again. You're going to find things you never remembered before. But then there gets to be this point where God announces what the judgment would be for Cain and his sin. And Cain has the nerve to say this to God. It's too much. Too much for me. Someone's going to kill me like you did your brother. But instead, what does God do? He puts a mark on Cain. He puts a mark on Cain so that would, that would protect him from ever being the target of anyone else's opinion or anyone else's wrath. Think about this again. Cain sinned. He killed his brother. And God covered him with his protection. Not because the murder of Abel was not a big deal, but because God is a good God. Because he's kind and generous and patient and faithful to himself, even when we're not faithful to him. Adam and Eve sinned and they deserve death. I'll cover you with animals. Cain kills his brother and says, I'm going to get killed. I'll cover you with a mark. Even when the earth was out of control, when, and when demons had come and made children with women, and the earth was in a position it was never meant to be in, what does he do? He covers it with a flood so that he can start with Noah and redeem the earth so that it won't go back to that place. Everything he's ever done has been to cover our sin because we can't cover it ourselves. But because he's a good God. Sin was not ever overlooked, but God covered sinners because he is gracious. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, both say, our God is a consuming fire. And yet here we are, not consumed. I don't like to do this often, but would you, do, would you just think about your life before Jesus? And then wonder how you're not consumed? Because we say, we say stuff that I know we mean well when we say it. Like, you know, sin separates us from God. God cannot look at sin. We say all this stuff that we, we want to understand, but we don't understand. But none of it actually paints God for who he is. Because if God, if sin separated us from God, we're dead. It's over. If God couldn't look at sin, how did he ever get to us? And thank God for, I know I read it last week, week before, I don't remember what, but thank God for 1 Samuel chapter 3 when it makes it so clear that God called to Samuel before Samuel knew him. Because you know how you got to him? He called to you before you knew him. He came to you before you knew him. Man, he's God, he's good. The reality that we are not consumed is good. 
but God's goodness. Yeah. Yeah. What if his holiness isn't his wrath? What if it's his grace? What if it's not the thing that consumes us, but the thing that keeps us from being consumed? Amen. What if the holiness of God is seen in forgiveness and redemption, not destruction and death? Psalm 89 verse 14 tells us that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. What if the place where those two things meet is what holiness looks like? What if the place where righteousness and justice come together is where God says, because I'm holy, I can hold out your sin until I cover it with my son's blood. What if that's what it means? What if it doesn't mean he's perfect and he's going to dole out judgment? What if it means he holds back judgment until he can give you his perfection? Because isn't that what the cross did? It didn't just wash our sin. It gave us Jesus' righteousness. And so the holiness of God is not, watch out, the holiness of God is, come close. I'll keep you. I will hold you. I will cover you. I will love you. We have all been loved in See, I'm a believer in this. Every one of us was prayed into the kingdom by somebody. Whether they knew us or not, whether we knew them or not, somebody, some way, prayed us into the kingdom of God. But here's the thing. We were loved into the kingdom of God by God long before we were interested. Had he been holy the way we like to describe it, we'd all be dead and heaven would be empty. So maybe we don't know what we're talking about. Maybe we need to let the scriptures speak more than we speak to the scriptures. When Moses interceded for Israel, it says that God relented. Moses, again, didn't change God's mind. He agreed with God's heart. He called on God's character. He partnered with God's desire that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Moses came down the mountain. He confronted Israel. God sent a plague of some sort. The Levites went about the camp and killed 3,000 men. The sin had consequences. Hear me. I'm not trying to say sin's no big deal. I'm trying to say it's a bigger deal than you think it is. That's why we need to see God's holiness more clear. Sin had consequences. There was a price to be paid, but mercy was offered and God was long-suffering. In that place, you know what happened? Righteousness and justice met each other. God told Moses, that he would not go with Israel. He told Moses that he would send an angel to take them to the promised land, but he would not go. That he could not go, because if he was in the midst of Israel for even a second, he would consume them. Now bear with me. Open your mind a minute. I'm not sure we understand what actually happened in that moment. Because I think we read it I don't want to say wrongly, I just don't think we read it slowly enough. See, I'm not sure we really understand the weight of our sin. I'm not sure we understand the depths of it, the separation it causes, and the patience that God shows. However, do we see that God saying that he would not go with Israel was his mercy and not his anger? God did not say, I can't stand to be around you, so I'm not going. Married folks, every once in a while you say, I need a break. I'm not talking about separation, I'm just saying, how about you go to work? Go, go to the store, go work on the building. Like, yeah, every once in a while there's just that, that space that's necessary. God is in no way saying, I don't want to be around you any longer. He's not saying that he's filled with anger. He's not saying that he's offended. He's not saying that he's upset over the situation. He is saying... That if I'm with you in the current state that you're in, I will be forced to consume you. See, the problem often is that when we hear God speak, when we read God, we hear him like a man. And we keep applying our emotions and our understanding to God's word. So because someone has told us at some point to go kick rocks because they were mad at us, we assume that when God says, I'm not going, that he's mad at us, that he's upset with us, that we have to now earn our way back into his heart and earn our way back into his kingdom somehow. Which is why we have so much bad theology, because we have this God that comes from our emotions rather than his word. And so we have these crazy ideas that he'll save me if I repent, but if I sin on the way home, I lost my salvation. How is that miraculous? How is that divine? How is that beautiful? How is it good that God says, I know you can't save yourself, but you've got to keep yourself saved? Just, would you just think about that part of it for a minute? 
You can't save yourself, but you have to keep yourself saved. What changed? I'll say it again. You've heard me say it a million times. I pray I live long enough to say it a million more. Your salvation is as strong as God's love, not your faith. His love endures forever. If you are in him, you will always be in him. Trust the character of God. He's not like us. He's not easily angered. He's not willing to be offended. He is loving, which means that he is patient and kind. He does not envy or boast. He is not arrogant or rude. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice in sin, but rejoices in the truth. It means that God bears all things. He believes all things. He hopes all things, and he endures all things. It means that he never fails. And get this, it means that his love covers a multitude of sin. And there we are again, back in Genesis 3. He covers the sin of sinners because we can't get the stain off of ourselves. That's right. That's right. And so in his kindness, he does what we cannot do because his love endures. Take forever out a minute because we like to make that about time. Let me tell you this way. His love endures your rebellion. His love endures your sin. His love endures your heart, heart and your unchanged mind. His love endures your slowness to trust Him. His love endures us. Because He's holy. But in all of this, when God says, I'm not going because I'll consume you if I'm with you even for a second, Moses knew God's heart and he wouldn't stand for it. Moses knew that the presence of God was far more important. It was far more valuable, far more treasured than the promised land. And so Moses said, if you don't go, please don't send us. Which I think it's a good thing Moses said that from the mountain. Because I imagine there would have been a large group of Israelites that would have said, wait a second, Moses. Wait a second. His voice scared us to death. He's told us his presence could destroy us. Let's just get to the promised land and we'll see what happens with this God. Moses was called for a reason. He was Israel's spokesperson, but here he was speaking for himself. I can think I can paraphrase it this way. I don't want the promised land unless you are in it with us. I want you. I'd rather stay in the desert the rest of my life with you than go to the promised land without you. Guys, are we willing to make that statement? Are we willing to say in his presence tonight, you know what? I've probably lifted some promises way higher than they belonged. I just want you. Because here's the thing that I've discovered is most of the time, if we just choose him, whatever the purpose was, he'll bring it about. Whatever the promise really was, he'll bring it about. And I'm not saying this is how you get what you want because he knows your heart. What I am saying is if we would ever delight ourselves in the Lord, we would discover that he becomes the desire of our heart. And when he becomes the desire of my heart, every single thing he gives me is good. And everything he withholds me, I trust from me, I trust his goodness in there's this point where we have to be willing to say, like Moses, I choose you. And what do we see? Again, God relents. He responds to Moses because Moses was speaking God's heart. God had no interest in a nation that wasn't his. He had no interest in a flock that someone else shepherded. He had no interest in a, in a land. He wanted his so Moses speaks God's heart. He was standing firm on what he knew was God's character. Moses then asked to know God's ways. And God says, my presence will go with you. So the ways of God are his presence. Then Moses asked to see God's glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And will proclaim before you my name. And we finally get to Exodus 34. That Lisa read like probably at this point an hour and a half. It says that the Lord descended in the cloud and that he stood there with Moses. It says that God himself hid Moses in the cleft of a rock, that he passed by him and he allowed Moses to see his back, which probably means that he got to see the train of his robe, that same train that Isaiah got to see hundreds of years later. Moses got to see it, and as Moses saw it, the Lord proclaimed himself. And so this is not Moses declaring to God. This is not Moses singing about God. This is not a worship service. This is Moses being hidden by the hand of God and God himself saying, the Lord Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. See this with me. God proclaimed what he had already given. He announced what he had already done. Israel earned his wrath. He had given them mercy. They deserved to be condemned. He responded with grace. They were unfaithful to him. He was faithful to his covenant with them. They had been quick to turn. He was steadfast and immovable, always abounding in his own work until they could abound in it with him. What kind of God keeps covenant with a stiff-necked people? Right? Who believes a liar? What kind of God makes a covenant with a stubborn and stiff-necked people? What kind of God responds to the intercession of his people? What kind of God makes a place to dwell among a people who had just made a God for themselves? What kind of God makes clothes for naked and ashamed sinners and promises a redeemer to the people who had just disobeyed him? What kind of God becomes sin? So that, those who knew, so that those who are sinners could become his righteousness. The answer is our God. The answer is Yahweh. The answer is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But most of all, I need us to see tonight, the answer is a holy God's holiness is defined by his character, by his announcement to Moses. His holiness is defined by his compassion and grace, his mercy and love, his forgiveness, long-suffering and faithfulness. His holiness is defined by his desire to redeem. Because redemption is the place where righteousness and justice live together. I talked about it before being holiness, but here's how it comes about. It is, it is realized in redemption. This is the place where our sin is paid for. It's the place where righteousness is now given to us because we couldn't earn it ourselves. It is the cross. Again, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And so justice was applied to Jesus. Righteousness was given to us. Holiness is who God is. The thing that makes God altogether other, that makes him completely set apart from every other God and from all of humanity is that he redeems. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, but God gives life and he gives it abundantly to those who don't deserve it, but are willing to believe him for it. His holiness is not the part that doesn't allow us to come close. His holiness is the part that invites us in even though we don't deserve to be there. Every other religion serves a God that promises rewards based on behavior. Behavior that's impossible to accomplish. Every other religion says, if you do this, you'll get this, knowing that you cannot do what's been asked of you. Why? Because the devil is the liar and, there are, and every other religion has one source, Satan. And since Jesus said that his native language is deception, that means that every lie of every other religion comes from Satan. But our God, yes. the one true living God, he offers us himself as the reward. And that he gave himself as the price to be paid for our sin. He redeems and restores us by the blood of his own son. He gives us mercy, which is not being given what you do deserve. And then he also gives us grace, which is giving you what you don't deserve. So he withholds what I earned and gave us what is his. He doesn't give me my wages. He gives me an inheritance. He gives me what belongs to him and what I don't deserve to have. God's holiness is not his power to destroy, it is, heart, it is his heart to redeem. His holiness is best seen in, seen in his steadfast love and his abundance of mercy and his amazing grace. The difference, the thing that sets God apart, the thing that makes him holy is his compassion. In the Bible reading plan, have you noticed what God did after he proclaimed his name to Moses? Have you noticed that after he showed his holiness and promised that he would go with Israel, that he then had them build the tabernacle. Stay with me just a couple more minutes. Before they could go, they had to have a place where God could dwell. So God said, I'm not going with you because if I go with you, I'll consume you. Moses said, we don't want to go unless you go. God said, okay, I'll go, but you've got to build a place for me to dwell. They didn't get up and leave. They had to sit down and work. They had to prepare the camp for the presence of 
They had to prepare their hearts for the God who refused to leave them, but also refused to consume them. Before they could go, they had to have a place where God could dwell. So again, he wasn't overlooking their sin. He wasn't saying, okay, let's just get over that whole golden calf thing. Let's just not worry about it. Let's, let's not talk about that anymore. I'll just go with you and we'll try again. He was saying, I'll go with you, but the only way I can do so is if I establish a place where my holiness can dwell with you without destroying. They did not move until the tabernacle was established. They stayed at Sinai until the tabernacle was established. God made a way to be among them, not because they wanted him, but because he would not let them go. That's his holiness. It's not how hard the tabernacle was to build. It's how willing God was to live in a, with a stiff-necked people because he loved. When the tabernacle was established, God filled it with his presence so greatly that Moses couldn't go inside. The priests couldn't even get in. If you notice that we always, we have these times, churches are even named Shekinah Glory. We talk about Shekinah Glory. Every time Shekinah Glory showed up, nobody could go in. So why do we want Shekinah Glory if it means that you've got to stay outside? I understand what we're asking, but again, if we read the scriptures, we'd understand what's happening here. That the presence of God was so thick, so rich, so holy that they couldn't even go in. The priests couldn't go in. God had made a way to be among his people, but God desired much more than just to be with them. He wanted fellowship. So then you get to Leviticus chapter 1, which we read yesterday. It's God speaking to Moses from the tent of meeting. So Moses is outside. God's inside. God gave the instructions for bringing burnt offerings. When bringing the burnt offering, verse 4 says, Lay your hand on the animal's head, and the Lord will accept its death in your place. Doesn't that mean you deserve to die? But I won't take your life. I will make a way. I, I am sure they understood this. I'm sure we don't. I am sure they thought about the golden calf. I am sure they thought about some of the complaints. I'm sure they thought about some of the miracles. And they understood that God is for us and he is with us. I'm not sure we understand because, again, I think we think our sins are mistakes. I will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. God was again making clear that there was a price to be paid. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The offering of animals took the place of the Israelites. The shedding of Jesus' blood has taken the place of all those who believe in him. And so when you think of the cross, don't just think of this thing that Jesus did in general. He took our place. He took my place. He took your place. He did this for us because of the holiness of God. I cannot say it enough. We are deserving of death. Our sin is great. We are far from God, already condemned. But His holiness makes Him patient. And His holiness makes Him compassionate. And His holiness causes God to make a way for us because we can't make a way for ourselves. And so I'll ask us again tonight, if our God is a consuming fire, why are we not consumed? I think Ephesians chapter 2 sums it up really well. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the other. Go ahead, Ed. But God. but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. So stop there one second. We often hear people say, you know, that, well, God doesn't love sinners. It says here he hates this sinner and he hates that sinner. But look what Paul says, that he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. Had he not loved us as sinners, he would have never gotten the chance to love us as children. He had to love us in our sin or else we would have had no way out of it. 
loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Sin is the thing that pushes us from God. Holiness is the thing that pushes God near us. And it's the thing that welcomes us where we don't belong. So I'll close with this last thought. And I pray that all this thought does is make you go read your Bible. Why is it that the angels are constantly shouting to each other about God's holiness? With all of God's beauty, His majesty, His power and authority, why do they never stop being amazed by His holiness? They never leave His presence. If anybody knows everything He is, it's them. And they sing one song about one word over and over and over again. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter wrote about the beauty and the power of redemption. He said that, he, he then said that, it, that our salvation is the thing that the prophets searched and inquired after. And then in verse 12 he wrote this, that our salvation is the thing that the angels long to look into. The angels were created by God. They live in the presence of God. They are used for the glory of God and the building of God's kingdom. But the one thing that separates the angels from us is redemption. The one thing that separates the angels from us is that Jesus shed his blood to save us. Peter says that the, that, that, that is the thing that they long to look into. But I believe that is the thing they're shouting about. I believe that the angels are shouting, holy, holy, holy. And what they're really saying is, he saves and he forgives and he holds back his anger. And he gives patience and he offers mercy and he shows compassion. He bears the sin of all and gives righteous to those who will believe. They're amazed by it because they can't be touched by it. And because it makes no sense to them. Yeah, yeah. Haven't you seen God work in somebody's life and thought, it makes no sense to me? I don't know God, why God would have done that for them. I don't know why God would have kept treating them that way. I don't know why God would keep being good to them. Imagine the angels watching the way we live. Of course they're, they're flying around the throne of God going, hey, He's holy! He's holy! He's holy! Have you seen what He's done for them? Have you seen how He loves them? Have you seen how He holds out compassion for them? They are amazed, and we are the poor. He's the whole, a holy God, which is the only reason that we have the opportunity to be a forgiven people. And so as we start, and we're going to spend a couple more weeks talking about holiness, but as we start talking about the holiness of God, don't live in fear of what God could do. Live in awe of what God has chosen not to do and then has done on our behalf. Because every one of us could have, should have been destroyed. And yet we sit here not consumed in the presence of an all-consuming fire. We were his enemies, but he has invited us to be his children. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abiding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for a thousand generations. He is a holy God, and by his blood he has made us a holy people. And so tonight, I pray that the Spirit and the Word would prick your heart and that you would feel two weights, the weight of your sin and the weight of his love. Because we will never know how great his love is if we run from how great our sin has been. It's not about being guilty and ashamed. It's about being in awe. Being in awe that a second should have consumed me. And yet, he pushed back his wrath, his grace. As we finish tonight, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He is holy, and we are his children. Can I get with me tonight?
I didn't ask beforehand, so I apologize. But could the worship team come back? And if you're able, we just sing through the verses of Holy, Holy, Holy. Because I just want us to do something tonight. Real briefly, we're going to sing this one song. I'm not going to linger. Go linger at home, alone in your closet. But if you're being struck by the weight of God's goodness, would you ask him tonight to show you the weight of your sin? I think some of us have thought it a light thing. And again, I don't want us to walk in shame, but I want us to be set free. And if we don't understand the weight of sin, we won't think it's a big deal to walk in it. It's just a little something extra we carry around. But I want us to be free. I want there to be no room for sin in our hearts, in our minds, our words, our relationships, in our lives. I want us to understand that we deserve to be consumed. And yet we are alive. And not just alive, He is alive in us. And so tonight, as we sing this through, would you just ask God, show me the weight of my sin so I can learn how to trust the weight of your holiness and receive the weight of your love. Let's sing this and I'll come back and close this. Father, we thank you tonight for your holiness. We thank you that you are a holy God. We thank you that there is a place where righteousness and justice meet, and they give us, and in that place you give us redemption. Thank you that we all know what we deserve. We pray that we would know in even greater measure who you are, so that we would celebrate the God who does not consume, but instead gives grace and makes us his children. Father, I pray tonight that you would search us and know our hearts, but I pray that we would let our hearts be searched and we would listen to your spirit. God, I pray that if there are places in any one of us that we keep our eyes closed so we don't see what you're saying, see what you're pointing out or hear what you're saying, I pray that we let you in. Pray that we stop pretending and stop hiding so that we can start being saved. Start being transformed. Start being set free. And so I ask tonight with some fear and trembling, put your finger on our sin tonight. Put your finger on our sin and where we have been unwilling to respond, let the heaviness of your hand press against us. Because David said that it was that heaviness of hate that finally led to repentance. And it was that repentance that finally led to freedom. Would you show us where our lives are being plagued by the heaviness of your hand? Because we will not yield the places of our sin. Thank you that we are not consumed. Thank you that like Judah, we are not consumed for your mercies. They fail not, but they are new every morning. 
Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faith. So I pray tonight, Lord, as we go, may your holiness change our thoughts, change our words, change our beliefs, and change our lives. May your holiness consume everything that has not come from you. And may your holiness refine everything that belongs to you. May we be a people who love you in your holiness, who worship you in your holiness, and that you can begin to make into a holy people. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. As always, if you'd like prayer, please see somebody. Don't feel like you've got to rush out. But if you need to rush out, go. Go in peace. Go do what God's leading you to do. God bless you. So good to see you tonight.